and also to assess their law, whether the pattern of thinking abilities um, um, can tell you perhaps what might be going on in the brain and whether that um, refers to a particular diagnosis. Um, and often to offer a slightly more detailed level assessment that can be thinking done by a GP or a neurologist in a brief examination. Um, sometimes um, this is just to get greater confidence in the diagnosis. Sometimes it might be, for example, in the context of people taking part in drug trials to measure has there been any change in a particular skill or is this such a treatment or a change in circumstance improving or stabilising um, the loss of a particular skill. But I think critical to all this, and this is where you come in with your, telling me of your experiences and us discussing them, is about helping people with dementia and their families and loved ones to better understand their difficulties. Lots of people um, say to me, well, I know I've got, you know, if I've got Alzheimer's disease, I mean, I'm not surprised that my memory is bad, but how am I getting these difficulties? I'm, see I'm seeing things that aren't there, or I'm misperceiving people's faces. Am I getting crazy? You know, because it doesn't fit the stereotype of their understanding or the public understanding of a certain condition, people start having extra worry, aside from dealing with the diagnosis they've got, and thinking, oh no, is there something else wrong with me as well? I've got a bad stroke and I've got a brain tumor. And again, that's where a psychologist sometimes can be helpful to try and understand whether um, a particular symptom is, is an expected part of a condition. So I don't expect you all to be budding neuroanatomists, uh, <laughs> although with this, with the London audience, you never know, there's usually someone who has got much, you know, much more about it than I do. Um, but basically this is a, a cartoon of a, um, as if you're looking at the side of someone's brain as if they're looking that way. So unsurprisingly, the front part of the brain is called the frontal lobes, imaginative. Um, the blue parts, the parietal lobes, the pink parts, the frontal lobes, and the green parts, the occipital lobes, so the back of the sort of visual processing center of the brain. And all I'd like to do is just initially just to take you through some of the tests that we use and which parts of the brain or which networks within the brain um, these tests are trying to tap into or understand the function of. So we often start, as psychologists, we often start um, tests of global functions and things like intellect and reasoning, um, whether that's reasoning about words, so you're related to answer something like how a portrait and a poem is similar. Um, I can see the initial kind of sweat on the brow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, or similarly, we have some tests, of course, which are non-verbal as well, um, such as this uh, matrix reasoning test where you get a pattern at the top of the page and one piece is missing, and you, your job is to choose which one of the five options at the bottom best fulfills that pattern. So these are called um, kind of global function tests because these are questions that require all sorts of different skills in order to be able to answer. So you know, just taking this one on the right hand side, for example, You've got to, it is clearly a very visual demanding test. You've got to be able to see what things are, where they are, how they're shaded. You've got to do some higher brain thinking about sort of comparing different ideas, different possibilities, thinking, oh, I know to be put number two in that space, would that work? Oh, no, it would be white, white, and black, so I need to change something. So every question that we ask in everyday life, even when we're asking people in simple conversations, there are many, many parts of our brain that are activated. And so some of the tests are just a kind of global sort of litmus test, if you like, of is, is this person functioning really, really well, or is it was something from a slightly poor. <coughs> the temporal lobes involved in various different skills, um, but people commonly point to it um, when thinking about your ability to uh, remember events, so we can have memory. Um, so it's also very important for your memory of facts and figures about the world, so called scientific memory, so the ability to know that grass is usually green or that the UK is in the EU, at least for now. Um, uh, and of course, there are certain aspects of language to keep understanding speech connected to that um, semantic memory, which for example is very important. So if you're trying the sort of tests that we might use to evaluate these sorts of skills are, for example, showing people a number of faces that they're not familiar with. And then giving them a display, as, as illustrated here in the bottom left hand corner, of several faces and saying, like, which one of those you've seen before, which is familiar to you, and which haven't you seen? So, for something where you, you're tapping into your outside, maybe you've, you've seen a face briefly, 
and now can remember the same things. I mean, something like semantic memory might be tested more by saying, you know, which is most similar to a marking attempt or a pass. Again, you don't have to respond to it. Um, do all these, you can do all these little things in very much in quite a if you want to. So that's just another example of some of those type of tests. If we're interested in the back of the brain, um, which particularly is um, affected by conditions such as posterior cortical atrophy, that's a visual variant of Alzheimer's disease, then these are some of the tests you might be particularly interested in. So tests which um, are evaluating different aspects of visual processing. So we might show people um, things like on the left hand side to say, you know, does that all look like random squiggles to you, or do you think there's a circle in the middle? Just circle or a circle. Or um, people trying to discriminate between two shapes, um, or discriminate between two colours. Because the brain is, is highly special, although it's very, very interconnected. The brain does have certain channels, certain bits of the brain, or certain pathways, which are particularly good at dealing with certain types of information. So, for example, there are bits of the brain that deal particularly with shape information, and other bits of the brain that deal particularly with colour information. So, it's actually possible, usually in the case of sleep or stroke, but sometimes in proximal cause of dementia, to lose one of those abilities and not the other. So, you can see some remarkable distinctions between things that people can and can't do. Just to give you um, uh, one brief example, I won't show a video for every condition, but as I mentioned um, this example of vision, it's an area which I know better than some of the others. I just thought I'd um, show you um, just a quick clinical example of someone who, who's living with PCA. And the reason for showing you this is there are various different levels at which you can test an ability or function. So if we take the ability to perceive where things are in space, um, this is a video about some, a neurologist doing a quite um, a powerful and clear but very simple assessment of saying, is this person's ability to locate things, to know, using their eyes, their brain to interpret where things are in the video space, how high, how low, left or right, how near or far from them. Can you hear that? Thank you. 
professions to talk to each other and share good practice about how to assess and evaluate certain conditions can be really valuable. So that's part of the project we have to do with the optometrists um, to try and improve assessment across. And here we have to think um, very briefly, um, again in this condition scale, just two of the um, difficulties that people have really picked up um, through the kind um, um, participation of people in PCA and research are two um, particular issues called crowding and reverse side effects. So crowding, um, I don't know if, you, I don't know if this will work, it depends how far from the screen you're sitting, but crowding is where if you look at the, the right hand blue circle, there's a clear letter A. If you look at the dot between the two circles, you might, depending on how far away you are, get the experience that the A in the right hand circle is easier to see, to identify, than the A in the left hand circle. And there's nothing different about the A's, but of course the one on the left hand side has got lots of other information around it. And that's called crowding, that's an effect that is, um, usually you see in the periphery um, of normal vision. And indeed, if you look directly at the left hand circle, those of you who don't have an ACA or another condition, you will most likely be able to see the A quite clearly, although there are lots of other lines as well. People with BCA can't see the A in that left hand circle, even when they look straight at it. The other, that other information crowds in and causes them to um, see a different letter. So, for example, in this bottom example, when you look at those three letters in black on the left hand side and I say which is the middle letter, I suspect for most of you it's very clearly a G. Someone with BCA might look at that and say, hmm, it's a Y. And it's not that they got confused about what the task is, they've not picked the one on the left or the one on the right or the one in the middle. What they've done is their brain has merged together or overcrowded all the information and features of the different matters to create a perfect, the apparent appearance of um, a different matter which isn't actually there. So that's all crowding. A different problem, again, that would surprise lots of people is that people with BCA often have difficulty seeing large print, not small print. Again, some social challenging shows to me. So that most people are a bit of a visual problem. The first thing they might offer to do to help you is make things bigger, not smaller. Whereas as you can see from these graphs, which are about how accurate someone is at identifying either a letter, a number, or a word, the smaller the print, the more accurate the performance. And why I'm telling you this is a bit, a bit geeky. Um, take those two bits of information, just think about how most people have their eyes tested. Most people will go to an optician and be shown something like this chart at the bottom. And this is about an eye test, so we're making sure, for example, you've got the right prescription glasses. If someone with a PCA went to their optician, we'll go to this. The top letter would be far too big for them. The bottom letters would probably be about the right size, but they're in a line of other letters, so they get crowded. Because, for example, the, the O, which is in the middle, there's an L on the U outside and other letters. So they might, they might most likely get that again, get that with letter wrong. And all you've got to do is show letters different sizes in isolation. That's the only thing you've got to do. But because it's not part of standard practice, people don't think to do it. So there's always opportunity to assess things better, to cater a test or an evaluation better to the different and the difficulties that someone has, and also the preserved abilities that someone has. Uh, moving on to the parietal lobe, that blue but the lobe at the top. Um, in a very, very easy discussion of work once, I was once asked, what is my favourite lobe? <laughs> I don't admit that to many people, but um, parietal lobe, I've got to say, would have, would have my vote because it uh, is involved in such an extraordinary variety of different skills. So, just a few of them are that the left side of your parietal lobe is particularly interested in things like numerous so numbers, letters, um, calculation, spelling, um, and also practice the ability to make learned gestures. Um, the right side of the brain, the right side of the right lobe, is particularly interested in things including, not, not limited to, uh, the perception of objects. So, for example, this photograph here, I don't know if most of you can see that, that's a fairly common object. It's a picture taken from quite an unfamiliar angle. So, it's a bucket. You usually see a bucket from the side with a handle at the top. And simply by rotating an object, um, I don't have anything to hand, but if it were the microphone, that's a sort of normal view. 
that's quite a tricky thing to identify from. And so the right part of the label is very good at like, being able to identify people or objects from different angles, for example. Um, because if you think about it, all, the image that's falling in the back of your brain is constantly changing when something's rotating around, and you still always still know what it is, you still know it's the same thing. Um, the right part of the label is interested in space perception as well. So the gentleman, for example, um, who's trying to um, locate a hand in front of him, we don't need any prior for it to be functioning more strongly in order to be able to work out the exact coordinates. Or, or also how different um, spatial locations relate to each other. So it's not like I'm aware that this computer is closer to me than the people sitting in front of me. Whereas some people, for example, in PCA, might be confused as to the spatial relationship between different things in the visual system. And the prior to that also really involved in us understanding how our bodies, our sort of position of our bodies, and interpreting the sensation that comes from the body parts as well. So, for example, some someone who struggles with the body, body position to ask you about it to say, well, I think we're going to have a difficulty with getting dressed, not just because they can't see, for example, where the sleeve of the jacket is, but because you and I, with our eyes closed, most of us can tell whether our arms are going to up or going to down. If you just sense that the information is coming into our brain and our joints, whereas if you come into the product level, you can't have to make that judgment anymore. And imagine how hard it would be to get dressed if you didn't know the way you went into that. It's kind of difficult to comprehend, really, because many of these skills are things we so completely take for granted and vision. It just, I don't think about, I don't have to think hard to perceive something. Uh, 60, 70 different faces in front of me, and my brain can immediately recognize um, people I've seen before and people I can't, know that the faces are different to one another. I don't have to any idea of that, it's just, it's just apparent to me. Um, and so, it's, for some of these difficulties, it's very strong for me to do these skills that we will take from all Another part of the brain, um, the, if you like, the part of the brain which distinguishes us most from non human primates, for example, is the frontal lobes. And the frontal lobes are very large in humans. And they get involved in all sorts of really complex and subtle functions. And if you get damage to your frontal lobe, as you might if you have something like unsanitary dementia, um, that causes a, a bash to the front of the hair or a stroke in front of the room, then you might have difficulty in so called executive skills. It is a slightly abstract um, phrase, it really describes this phrase. The sort of um, thinking processes that are involved in complex decision making or deciding to do or not do something. Um, so, for example, the front lobes, different parts of the front lobes, are involved in preparing. If you're thinking of doing an action, so, for example, going to the shops um, to buy something, you might need to prepare what you're going to do. You might need to sort of set the task and think, oh, I'm going to go there for this that item, there for someone else, something else. You need to energize yourself, you need to kind of get up and go and actually not just think about going to shop, but actually go to shops. You need to sustain that activity and not to walk into Tesco, go to the first thing you need and then go home and go. And you need to complete the task. You need to concentrate on what you're doing, so if you're looking for a particular type of drink, you don't want to just grab any bottle, you want one with your particular outfit. You also need to suppress things as well, you can't just walk around just go buying every single thing. And if you like it much, it's not just in the reality of your pleasures. And you need to sort of have the ability to come to choose certain things, or to not choose or not do certain things. Or when someone cuts you up in the aisle and puts it in front of you in the queue, you might be very tempted to tell them what you really think of them. But actually, you might be interested in the same child that's shooting me. I shouldn't use that word. I just need to use that instead. Um, and also, you need to be able to switch, you need to move between doing different different tasks. So these are just some of the subtle um, processes, which again, we're taking the abilities to. There are only, uh, you know, there are only a handful of kind of regular events for me where I can notice one of these, um, one of these uh, processes failing. I don't know if you so if you like suppressing the urge to do something, um, I sometimes walk into my bathroom and one of my clothes will let the light on. And I will, I will just automatically pull the light on. Not because I need to, but just because it's part of my automatic routine. And my brain has failed to suppress that part of that usual routine. So I turn the light off and turn on again. So I think the system breaks down. But most of our actions, though very complicated, are so smooth that we 
you've got to identify what it is. You've got to retrieve its name. So it's no good knowing what it is, you've got to be able to work out what sound or you're writing down what shape of organization letters would correspond to. And then you've got to produce that word so you're very part of your brain to sort of think what's that sound I'm aiming for. But also how can I tell the muscles on my face to make that sound calling my breathing, my moving to my lips, my jaw, and everything else. So there are people who are like, oh, these things are highly interactive, but it's such a complex process that any one of those steps you manage them could slow you down or stop you either from seeing what it is, from understanding what it is, from being able to retrieve its name, um, or being able to make someone else know you. And so someone with a PCA, for example, might struggle with the first one, the first step in the process. Someone with a semantic connection might be able to perceive it clearly, but it wouldn't relate to anything that they want to know. Someone with one of the progressive modulated phases, for example, might know exactly what the thing is, but they're not going to be able to retrieve the name. Stages, several branches of height and specific in the case of the brain effect, 
for a CBA song in his uh, years later. Many other skills may affect his disease spreads um, to other parts of the bone. So, whilst in early PCM, for example, it might be very tight to have some good, many of the good tests that people are affected on, then several years down the line, it might be that memory is also very affected. And that comes to the perhaps for some people, at least, less um, familiar with the condition or difficult to tell is a sign of PCA or similar to the right sign of disease. And there are lots of confounding benefits, so things that you might have a particular um, difficulty and ability to do are just kind of due to some of the other dimensional age, so the impacts not just because of um, age and interaction with educational factors in their age, but of course we all, myself included, are all losing brain cells from about the age of 20 or so years. And so you do see subtle changes in the minimalness of certain aspects of um, cognition. Things like reading may very well change over age, whereas uh, speed of testing and making decision making often slow down with age. Uh, and of course, lots of the media things, your mood, whether you've got a headache, how tired you are, how much sleep you had last night, your level of alertness, they all affect the sort of uniform tests. So all of these things have to be taken into account when you see someone. And it's not unfortunately like a, a diagnostic genetic test or a blood test or anything so quantity. This is normal and normal. There's lots of subtleties involved in the interpretation tests. Um, uh, see, yeah, sorry, what was your question? How about emotion and culture? Um, for example, I don't like books, so she doesn't wear a pair. And the living part could be anything. You really love to do it. So it could be thinking of that, it could dominate. Absolutely, there are all sorts of things. One of the sort of holy grail of the cycle is the culture neutral test. I strongly suspect it doesn't exist because we're all very from generation, from social background, from cultural background, the country we were brought up in, the faith belief systems we may have. It can all, all these things can start to affect um, some aspects of our thinking and ideas. So um, I think psychologists really have to be quite cautious in interpreting these tests. I have to try and give it as much a, a diagnosis or an impression as they can, but it mustn't go too far in having too much confidence in what I'm going to show. Very good question. Um, so, most standard used tests, um, well, some of us have been tested on a whole group of different ages to get that. Not only really have any neurological condition, but the idea being that yes, all of us will respond differently to those sorts of questions. So, what we're trying to do, the, the story manual for that question, for example, would list acceptable answers and less acceptable answers, and you get to the two points one and the low points for a good response or an average response. Um, so, you're actually right, and often the design of these tests, they have to throw away lots of their own questions because they don't have a good question. Which to be honest, and we get to know the answers, but that would be a really bad question to try and assess when a patient was your answer to normal or not. So, what would be expected or not? That was another question. Yeah. Very interesting question, but a very difficult one to answer. I think there have been some studies uh, in which you looked at age and rate of progression, um, but of course, it's always difficult. Know what we're really, are you really comparing life with life? So, if you go through young, young people with Alzheimer's disease, old people with Alzheimer's disease, sure, they're different in their age, but they're also different in all sorts of other risk factors heart disease, cholesterol, all those sorts of things which have to be taken into account. So, the studies are quite hard to do. There has been a um, suggestion that things like cognitive reserve, so the effect is essentially you have to spare cognitive capacity you have to get protected, you have to serve.
We thank you for being willing to share and willing to see the things. And we definitely think the most important thing about the community is not a talk like this, it's a talk that you do during lunch and coffee and everything else. So please do so and please do talk. If you've got questions you know, we're asking with almost half the time, let me know you have trains catching and please do don't feel the right to say if you want to say talk and ask questions, then please do. Um, but thank you very much.